And you're also welcome to sit and just listen. That's also an active participation. So what we're doing is trying to listen to one of these modes, taking in that sound and reinforcing it with our voices. That's to make it a bit simpler, while reducing the visual field and walking as slowly as possible and see what happens. variety of interactions, influences, intentions and potential interpretations increase, of course, immensely. However, a less anthropocentric model is needed. The field of musical theory makes clear that interaction in improvisation should not only be regarded as a communic communication exchanges between musicians on stage. Besides musicians, more agents are at work during an improvisation. Space, acoustics, instruments, audience, technicians, musical background, technology, etc. Interactions take place between the musician and her or his instrument or more specific, between the fingers and the keys or the strings. Interaction takes place between an instrument and the amplifier, between the musician and the musical past, between an instrument and the performance space or the acoustics, between the musician and technology, between the musician and the audience. Now, not all of the agents mentioned above determine every improvisation to the same extent. In certain situations, periods, styles, cultures, as well as more singular circumstances, some are more prominent and active than others. Therefore, theorizing on improvisation in general is useless. Singularity should be emphasized. Each improvisation yields a different network of agents and interactions a different configuration, a different assembly. 
Instead of circles, think nodes and vectors. Besides actors, add factors. Rethink the network as a set of interconnected nodes, an architecture that cannot be controlled from any center. Nodality rather than centrality. The field of musical improvisation is a highly interconnected, complex system in which minds and bodies of the musicians engage with local situations, including technical, acoustic, spatial, material, historical, cultural, and societal information. Thank you. By Rutger Zuiderveld and Gerko Hiddink from uh, the Machinefabriek, the Machine Factory, uh, a musician and a composer, and they will talk about uh, a project they did, uh, Bridges, which involves uh, a lot of improvisation, and they'll basically. Guys? cards to get me through the presentation. Um, hi, I'm Gerko Hiddink. I'm a graphic designer from uh, Nijmegen. This is Rutger. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Bridges, the design. And Rutger is going to talk about Bridges, the music. Um, in the spring of 2008, I was asked to join uh, the Uncovered project. This was a project uh, that had, had the idea or the, or the question, uh, what happens when we uh, turn the process of making a record around? So instead of uh, starting with the music and then the designer make, uh, d designs the, the package, uh, they uh, wanted to start with uh, the design and then ask musicians to make music to it. Um, this was in the form of a contest and uh, the prize the winner would get was that uh, musicians would be asked to uh, compose music to the design. Um, uh, I've always been interested in uh, the possible relationships between music and graphic design, so I thought this is a nice challenge. But how do you start a thing like that? Because uh, normally as a graphic designer you're uh, used to react to something you get, like in, th in this case music, and it gives you ideas about atmosphere or, or, or style or whatever, and then you start uh, designing. But now I had to com come up with uh, something myself which would inspire musicians. Um, some weeks late. Oh, this I forgot this one. So this was the central question: Can a record start with the design? Um, some weeks later, I was uh, driving across the bridge over the Rhine uh, near Emmerich, that's on the just on the other side of the border, on the eastern side of this country, and um, this is what it looks like and where it is. Uh, if, well, it looks a bit blurry, but uh, you have to look through that. But um, I actually grew up some 25 kilometers uh, east from this bridge. And uh, as a kid, my dad used to take me on long bike rides. And this bridge would be on the far end on, of such a ride, cause, considering you had to cycle all the way back. So I uh, have stood many times at the foot of this bridge, staring at the other side, but we never crossed this bridge. So in a way, this, uh, this bridge and, the, and then the land on the other side grew to almost mythical proportions to me, because what, 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 was, what was on the other side? And it was Germany, so... Um, <laughs> well, no, <laughs> that, well, this bridge is already Germany. I was in Germany already at that point, but uh, it has nothing to do with Germany. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but, of course, at some point, I did cross this bridge, and, in fact, now I'm living 25 kilometers uh, in the opposite direction of this bridge. So this bridge is uh, in the middle of where I live and where I grew up. Um, then I thought, um, can, can this bridge be a starting point for the design? Uh, well, and I, because uh, I, I, I was trying in a way to, to uh, bridge the gap between uh, design and music. So I thought, hey, maybe a bridge is a nice metaphor. 
Um, so what I did next, I uh, picked four bridges between uh, Nijmegen and Sinderen. That's the very small village uh, where I grew up. And in the middle is the, the, the bridge over the Rhine and another one, the Netherlands Channel, which is exactly the border between Germany and Holland. Um, and I decided to document those bridges. So what I did on a fine day, I took my bike. Yeah, there I am. Um, and I have my video camera with me. And I'm si the first thing I do, I cycle to the bridge over the Waal. And um, I start filming this bridge just with a handheld camera, very shaky, looking for structures or repeatment or text anything that I associate with music or could be associated with music, like lo loopings and... So, when I did that, I cycled on. Well, um, then I cycled on to the next bridge, which was the bridge I was talking about, the, the pink bridge near Emmerich. Well, same here. Yep. Now, well, interesting things there, like sort of pinkish nipples. Well, that's what I see in it. Well, <laughs> I know that's my... I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and nice romantic uh, things like ich liebe dich. <laughs> okay. Um, and I cycle on. But uh, there was a reason why I was filming those bridges and not taking pictures of them, like photographs. Because I thought music is a time-based thing and, uh, and a record sleeve is a static thing in print. And I thought if, if, if I use video, which is time-based as well, uh, and I find a way to translate that video to, to the static thing that is a record sleeve, there might be still this element of time and movement and flow in it. But at this, this point, I didn't know how, how, I would, how, I would, uh, how and if I would succeed. But I thought it was an interesting thought, and I just begin filming and see where it ends. <clears throat> well, then I cycle on to the last bridge, which, which is uh, in Sindarin. This It's just behind the, the, the house that I grew up. Mm, there it is. It's a very small brook, and, uh, and it used to be a wooden bridge, uh, which was only used to get cows from one paddock to another. Very green there. Now they put it in concrete, though, but it's not, a, not, as, not as idyllic as I thought, but it's very green, so that's nice. Nice structures. And luckily, there were still cows. Okay, um, so I got home with a, with a couple of hours of very shaky video, and uh, I asked myself, what, sh what shall I do with it? Um, the first thing I did was I extracted uh, sequences out of this video, like this, of things I liked. <laughs> okay, um, I shall not comment on that. Um, and uh, if, you, if you put a sequence like that on a timeline again, uh, you get a stop-motion version of the video, which is quite logical, of course. Uh, yeah, it's just... But uh, it, it's looping instead of, uh, in, instead of uh, uh, one direction. And uh, the, the next thought I was, how, how can I put this idea of loopings into a static thing like a, like a record sleeve? And uh, the solution I came up with is, uh, if I put them in rings, they loop. So uh, this is what I did, yep. Uh, and if you put these rings next to each other, it becomes a circle. And then, and then, of course, the idea came, well, it's a circle. Wouldn't it be nice if, if this could be printed on uh, vinyl, like a picture disc? So I did this for all the four bridges. Uh, you get a, like an abstract version of this bridge, an impression of it with all kinds of suggestions for text and, and, and uh, atmosphere and rhythm. Um, and, uh, well, there are four bridges, four sides. I thought, hey, this must be... a uh, a double LP picture disc, which is quite extravagant, but, but very nice for a designer, of course. So um, what I did next, uh, there has to be a dust cover on this. 
And what I uh, put there was the, the geographical map of the, the water uh, waterways around it. And I did this. And on the sleeve itself, uh, there is, is again the circle with a hole in, uh, on the inside, which is the center of the letter A in this case. And then there's the other one with the dust cover and the letter B. Letter C. And D, so uh, these are the four sides of the, of the record, A, B, C, and D. Um, in the end, I didn't win the competition, though, which <laughs> was a shame, of course. Uh, but it was a funny thing. After a presentation, someone came up to me and said, hey, this, this, this is a nice project. I know someone who's really into su such things, and that's uh, Rutger Zuiderveld. He's from Machinefabriek. But this guy doesn't know that Rutger and me are friends for quite a while. Uh, we went to the same art school and even made music in a very distant history. Um, so I thought that's, that could be a good idea. So I asked Rutger, and what did you say, Rutger? <laughs> <laughs> I will tell them, Gerko. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi there. Um, obviously, I was very surprised by Gerko being approached by someone asking maybe machine if we could do something uh, with this. Um, also because I just did, did a project for uh, the International Film Festival in Rotterdam and it was based on this bridge, so I already worked with bridges. Um, for this project uh, they asked me to sort of um, create a film but audi only in audio without images, so I went to the bridge because they wanted me to do something that's typically Rotterdam and for me, I live in Rotterdam for five years now, and that bridge was also always like the most beautiful thing in architecture. architecture. So I went there and made some recordings and uh, made a composition out of that. No. We should have sound now. <laughs> This is only a really tiny, tiny fragment of it. Um, so when I was asked, uh, or oh, sorry, when Gerko told me about this project, I was sort of in doubt, because firstly I, I did this and I didn't really want to repeat myself. Um, but on the, on the other hand, it was such a funny story that I couldn't resist doing nothing with it. So um, I started thinking, what, what else could we do with the bridge? Because in this case, I used the recordings and I morphed them and processed them and to make something completely different out of it. And um, uh, this time I wanted to take the same approach as Scherko did with the bridges, so go there and uh, uh, document what you can find and then see what you com come up with. So we took a recorder and went to the same bridges and recorded as much as, as, much as material as possible. This. So we ended up with uh, quite a quite a lot of audio material and not sure what to do with it. Um, and then I yeah, actually and then I thought, uh, well, uh, one of the nice things about uh, listening to the environment, which was basically what we did at that moment. Um, was enjoying these sounds, and you can listen to them as being music, even if it's not composed or whatever. Just open your ears and, and see or hear the beauty in that. And with that concept in mind, we came up with the idea to uh, ask improvisers, uh, improvisers that are act active like in the electroacoustic world, you wanna have a, wanna, whatever you want to call it. And, we asked these people, uh, some of them I already worked with and other ones were like high on my wish list to ever work with. So we just emailed them with the plan like, can we send you a, a, a recording and treat it as if it's is an instrument and you're playing a duo with it. And the re reactions on that were actually pretty positive. Um, actually, like all of the people said, wow, this is really nice. Um, and for something that's started sort of like a, like a hobby project or maybe some, some kind of adventure where we didn't know how it would, would end. Um, now we couldn't go back anymore because everyone said they, they're in. 
so uh, um, we, we sent each uh, of the of the musicians a recording of 10 minutes, 10 minutes of the bridge, uh, unedited, just 10 minutes as they were at that time. And um, I asked Nate Woolley and John Muller, who were part of the project, to uh, tell a bit about how they experienced it. Here we come. My name is Nate Woolley, and, and my portion is in duo with Mats Gustafsson. Uh, when Rutger sent the field recording to me, I, I was a little wary, to be honest. I, I'm nervous about playing with field recordings because I have a tendency to attach narrative to things, and usually it makes for a really bad musical experience. And uh, bridges and the sound of vehicles going over bridges, that has a special connotation to me for some reason, uh, probably because of where I grew up in a rural area where that sound was prevalent. You could go hear that without the buzz of other traffic around. Um, so my way of dealing with that was to listen to the track a number of times and trying to abstract something out of it that I could still attach a narrative to and still feel like I had made some kind of something musically satisfying as far as an arc, um, but wasn't obvious. Um, and was abstract enough that without me telling you, you wouldn't necessarily get the narrative, which I didn't feel like I could do with the original field recording. So after listening to it a long time, uh, for some reason I connected with this idea of it sounding like a snare drum rudiment slowed way, way down. Uh, there's a feeling that everything's connected, but, but just slowed down. The sound is somewhat constant, but it, it's just been stretched. And so I played over it like I was playing an energetic um, kind of duo with a drummer, but the drum track had been slowed way down. Mueller? Hi, this is John Mueller. I want to talk a little bit about the Bridges Project. So when I received the uh, bridge recording from uh, Rutger, I, I, I thought, you know, in some ways it's similar to as if it were a saxophone or a guitar. Uh, you're really just, you know, reacting to what sounds you're hearing and listening to what happens next. But beyond that, a, another layer entered the picture in terms of geography and, and place and really feeling that while I was playing along with it, in some ways I, I had the sense of being somewhere else, which is uh, a little bit unusual too. Instead of being just in the moment and being in the place uh, where you would normally perform or improvise with with another person or uh, group of people, really felt that you were geographically somewhere different. Sorry for the dark video. Um, as John already uh, says, uh, it's quite interesting that um, these players sort of like communicate with the sound they get while being geographically on another spot, and. Um, I was thinking it would be nice to sort of like enhance the bridge concept even a little more. So uh, the next step we took was, um, or actually it was the next step we asked in the beginning, but for this story. Uh, another thing we asked is um, we asked two people per bridge recording to react on the recording, to improvise on it, without them uh, uh, hearing from each other what they did. So uh, we combined these later, uh, hoping that in this way uh, um, we would we could we would get like really unpredictable, super exciting uh, uh, results because they were not supposed to be played that way, but because they are at the same uh, source they're reacting to, it should make uh, uh, some sense. So um, well, that's what we did, and we got the recordings back, and we were really happy with it. And oh, right, what I wanted to say. Um, so actually we used the recordings of the bridges as actual bridges between uh, two musicians. So it's uh, and a bridge between music and environmental sound and a bridge between uh, um, two musicians being in different continents. And I think it, it worked beautifully when I first heard it with Matt's part because he also seemed to approach it without a sense of that obvious narrative, but he had these real static floating tones. And the two things really don't match, um, put side by side. I think that it worked, but when Rucker added the original field recording track back in, there's a certain kind of abstract sense of glue with that track in the middle of it 
that made the disparate elements of uh, Matz's and, and my part really work together in a way that I wish I could do improvising, where the disparate elements are, are just clashing and rubbing up against each other. It makes for a really interesting piece of music to me and something that I've been able to think about since doing it. And uh, I think it was a really positive experience. He can explain it much better than I can. Um, so we had the recordings, but now what? Because, well, Herco designed this ridiculous uh, uh, double picture disc LP, and, well, that's, I don't know if ever one of you uh, ever made a record, but making a double LP is already expensive, and making a double picture disc LP is crazy, and even as if the, the record has, like, um, die-cut holes in the sleeve, that's just, that's a nightmare. But still, we, we tried, we did our best, so... Uh, 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 first of all, we thought of some labels that would be interesting. Um, because, of course, a nice thing when you work with a label, you get distribution. If you're lucky, same thing with promotion. And you don't have to worry about a lot of things. Just hand them the stuff and supposedly it will be all right. Um, so we contacted, we contacted a few labels and um, a few were interested, but most of the times, uh, also with the ones interested, there was one concern the finances. So um, there were quite a few mills going back and forth between labels and us. Um, and at a certain point, we were talking about, well, maybe we should do it on LP, but not picture disc or CD or whatever. Uh, all kinds of things that sort of felt like not doing justice to the original idea. So after a couple of months, we got just too tired of it. And we thought, like, maybe we should do it ourselves. So we decided to just uh, gather some, some saving money and take the risk of doing it ourselves. So we had to uh, let down uh, some labels with meals like this. And we started working on our own, uh, making, making models and uh, having test pressings made. And then the boxes arrived, ridiculous heavy boxes that had to be carried like three stores in my home. It was Terrible, and then we had to all like wrap them separately and number them. And the ink did dry like really slowly, so my room was like this for three weeks. <laughs> and after using a like a hair dryer, it, it got dry enough, and uh, we sent them with a large bill. <laughs> so. I'm really excited to see what the physical product ends up looking like. That's why we're here for. I will hand some of these LPs just to look at them, although it's a bit dark. The music you heard here was uh, by DJ Sniff, who uh, asked us to be here as well. And um, it's sort of like um, last, the finishing touch uh, on the project. He used the, uh, the test pressings of the Bridges record to make new music out of it, improvising. And he actually will do the same uh, this Friday in Worm. Well, we do be, we'll be doing the same presentation, but also with percussionist Burkhard Bynes joining him. Um, that's it. We have some of these LPs for sale there. I have some with me as well. Um, thank you. <laughs> Are there any? Well, we got four, five, six hands. Okay, 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 okay. More. It's a complicated question. It is a complicated question, I know, I know. That's a question. Well, is, the, is it a real question that I'm giving, going to give you the microphone? <laughs> of course. <you're> gonna... <laughs> uh, the previous one was so short. Like, why, why records? Um, yeah. Um, why did you feel like having to bridge um, design to music? Did you feel there was a difference? Um. 
Well, those are quite different things, I think. Uh, in the first place, music and design are, well, uh, graphic design, mo mostly graphic design aesthetic instead of you, if you're animating or, or whatever. But it was, uh, of course, the, the reason why I started it was the project where they wanted to turn the process around. So uh, I, I, the, the, I, I asked myself if I was a musician and I would get something. Uh, I, I, it would be nice that there would be some... Uh, um, uh, information for me to to start with, and I thought in this way, uh, in the end, it it could work like a uh, like a, a moving photo sc uh, graphic score or something like that. So that's what I thought would be nice, and 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 the could and the music could be anything. Uh, there could be heavy metal music or singer songwriter, but in the end, well, of course, it's well. Yeah, I, I, this could be released with other music as well, but in the end, it's, this project grew quite organically, so I didn't know where it ends, but this, this was the reason for it. Cool, thanks. Looks, looks great. Thank you. Okay, well, I'd, like to, I'd like to move on. To our uh, next speaker, uh, David Toop, you're going to prepare that one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Who, who will be preparing you? Uh, how to describe them, post-punk, industrial improv rock band of the um, 1970s onwards. Um, I actually auditioned for the job of guitarist when they were forming, uh, probably in about 1976, and I showed up just with a tape. And there was another guitarist auditioning, a, a guy called Alan Holdsworth, who is <laughs> very f uh, famous for playing incredibly fast. Um, and uh, I played my tape, which was basically an improvisation of guitar and drums, very simple. And at the end of it, Alan Holdsworth said, what's that instrument? <laughs> <laughs> It's a question I've been asking myself. Well, I was asking myself before that, actually. Um, but the, the wider question, what is an instrument? What you're looking at here is um, an 18th century earthenware violin. You can actually see it. In, it's in the, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam here. And uh, it's made by a technique called faience. Um, it's also known as Delftware, and uh, it's a very interesting object. It's, uh, um, it uh, embodies the influence of Chinese, imported Chinese pottery from the 16th century, this, this blue and white finish. And uh, you can see on the body of the violin a very charming drawing which shows uh, two string players playing to dancers in a dance hall. But charming as it is, that drawing fails to animate the instrument. So uh, in a way, this object is closer to, say, a flower vase than it is to a musical instrument. The thing has become everything. see here is um, a, um, a, a drawing, a collage of a violin made by Picasso. Um, Picasso made many of these uh, assemblages, collages, drawings, paintings of stringed musical instruments from about 1912 onwards. Many, many guitars. And uh, some, in some of them he used uh, inc incredible 
uh, groundbreaking mixed media. He used cafe tables, he used actual guitars, he used representations of, of life size people. Uh, so he exploded the instrument out, you could say, into space. And I think what uh, there was a couple of interesting things going on. You see, if you think of this in the context of cubism, cubing, cubism was taking the object and looking at it from many different perspectives. And from that point of view, the guitar is extremely interesting because you can think of the guitar as almost like a little house. It's like a chamber, isn't it? It's, it's an enclosed space. And it produces music in time. And music resonates within the body of the, the guitar and then it flows out into space and it animates the air. This is actually what an instrument is, not the earthenware violin which looks more like uh, a violin in the conventional sense than Picasso's violin. And Picasso did some incredible things, like for example, he took what was inside the guitar and he made a cylinder, like a cardboard cylinder, so it was almost as if the guitar was vomiting out its, its own interior. So, in a way, you, you see the beginning of a kind of thinking, an, an improvisation, if you like, of deconstructing the instrument. And so, the question arises, where is the instrument? For the last six years, I've directed uh, an ensemble at London College of Communication, uh, which I've called unknown devices. And this began as a, as a teaching thing. Um, I was teaching a, an improvisation module to second year sound art and design students. Um, this, is, this is one manifestation of the group in Tate Britain in London. Uh, we're playing in front of a fantastic romantic Victorian era romantic painting called Gordale's Scar by James Ward. And this is a group of 22 people, I think, roughly, which is quite large for an improvising ensemble. But uh, typical, I think, of the motivation of the, of the people who become involved. Uh, from the classes in improvisation, we started to do live performances. And um, one of the things that I like about this group is that it's constantly changing. So, you know, in, in some respects, it, respects it, it, it's tied to the academic cycle. You know, students do, do the uh, option with me, and then they're interested for a bit, and then they graduate, and they go on to do other things. And, and so uh, the interest or the possibility for them of being involved in the public performances wanes, but they're replaced by other people. Now, th these are sound art and design students on the whole. They're not musicians, though some of them are musicians. This is, this is a performance at, uh, in the Turbine Hall of uh, Tate Modern. And as you see, the range of instruments they play is quite diverse. So you've got uh, conventional guitars with lots of pedals. You've got theremin. You've got... Uh, lots of acoustic instruments, amplified, you've got uh, straight laptops, you've got all kinds of cracked electronics, um, uh, you've, got, uh, here you've got somebody playing a stand-up electric bass. Um, and that very unpredictable combination of technologies combined with the very unpredictable levels of skill and awareness um, it means that you have very particular challenges in, in bringing together this group. And you really have to talk to them and, uh, let's say, open a place in which improvisation can happen so that you achieve um, a reconciliation of diversities, let's say. Um, 
That's why I called the group Unknown Devices, because you never knew what people were going to turn up with. The first, I remember the first time I did it, a lot of people turned up with laptops, because it was still very much that era, but one guy turned up with a, a power drill. And, uh, <laughs> and then I think about two years ago, uh, there was a completely new set of students, and I was the only one with a laptop. So I was like the oldest guy in the room, and I had a laptop, so I was already kind of old school in that sense. Everybody else had moved on to, to different things. And I find that really fascinating. But, of course, what we have to deal with is, uh, you know, the issues of what happens when people come together, you know, issues of selfishness, self-interest. Um, and uh, can everybody come to terms with their own difference. So everybody has different uh, areas of interest. You know, the different musical styles. You know, people like, typically they like hip-hop, they like uh, noise music, they like dubstep, they like black metal. You know, some of them like improv in the classic sense. Um, some of them are more interested in electronic improv making new instruments. Some of them have never played an instrument in their life before, so they come along and they say part of their um, part of the project for them is discovering an instrument in a way. So maybe I say, well, why don't you try f using a phone? You know, bring a radio or something, something that makes sound. Um, I'll just play you a brief uh, selection from one of the groups but this is you can't say that this is typical because all of the groups have sounded completely different <laughs> I must say I don't always like the music, <laughs> but the process is always fascinating. What you see here is a page uh, from a small book I edited in 1974 called New and Rediscovered Musical Instruments, and that brought together the work of improvisers who were making their own instruments. Um, and uh, So Evan Parker, Paul Litton, Max Eastley, Hugh Davis, Paul Burwell and myself. And in that small group, you already have certain trends uh, you, that can be identified. So, for example, Hugh Davis working with amplifying uh, small devices, uh, stuff from his kitchen, using contact microphones, uh, inventing instruments, working with springs, you know, all the kind of thing that is very familiar now. But, you know, he was one of the pioneers in that. Paul Letton working with amplified percussion as an improviser. Uh, Max Eastley working with aeolian instruments, uh, instruments which in some way use, were driven by the environment. This is one of my instruments, and it's a conceptual instrument, let's say. Uh, I did make the instrument 
but I never put it into practice. The idea was that I would capture a wasp, a live wasp, uh, put it in the little compartment by the f attached to the flute, and then the wasp buzzing would make a drone, and I would play to, uh, to that accompaniment of the drone. I never put it into practice, but <clears throat> this, was this was inspired by um, instruments like uh, a live beetle jews harp um, played in Papua New Guinea, where um, a beetle would be a living beetle would be attached to a jews harp and it would buzz away, and then the jews harp would be played along to that. Um, I have a short example. I was at that time, and I'm talking about 1970 onwards, I was interested in ecology. And that was really uh, the beginning of a particular phase of the ecology movement. And what interested me was the ecology of systems and improvisation. Had, uh, and improvisation had a great potentiality for discovery because it distributed the responsibility of making. But it was these important questions. Um, how does music connect to the environment? Um, social meaning of music.